Welcome to People, Places, Planet Pod, the official podcast of the Environmental Law Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization working to ensure a healthy environment, prosperous economies, and vibrant communities founded on the rule of law. There are many benefits to solar energy, but what about its impacts on wildlife? In today's episode, we engage the experts and listen in on a conversation between two experts, Brooke Marcus Wahlberg and Carl Koscheck. Brooke Marcus Wahlberg is a partner at Nossiman's Austin, Texas office. Brooke has been focused on federal and state natural resource issues, particularly wildlife issues, for most of her career. Her work spans across several industries, including wind and solar energy, electric transmission and distribution, water infrastructure, and timber management throughout the United States. Brooke frequently speaks on federal natural resource issues before national audiences, including the American Wind Energy Association's annual Environmental Inciting Conference. She co-chairs CLE International's annual Migratory Bird Treaty Act and Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act Conference. And since 2018, Brooke has served on the planning committee of the University of Texas Renewable Energy Law Conference. She regularly guest lectures at the University of Texas at Austin School of Law on federal wildlife risk and renewable energy development. Joining Brooke today is Dr. Carl Koschuk, who is a senior biologist at Western Ecosystems Technology, Inc., otherwise known as WEST. Carl holds a master's degree from Texas A&M University and a doctorate from Kansas State University, where he focused on avian ecology. His consulting work over the course of 13 years has focused on the intersection of wildlife issues and energy development, and he is an expert in assessing potential impacts and evaluating realized impacts to wildlife from development. Carl frequently presents on wildlife issues at conferences, including the Solar Power International Annual Conference. Carl currently leads West's Solar Practice Group, where he coordinates a consistent approach among West's solar projects. He recently co-authored a paper entitled A Summary of Bird Mortality at Photovoltaic Utility Scale Solar Facilities in the Southwestern U.S. in the journal PLOS1. On this podcast, Brooke and Carl will discuss their work at the nexus of solar energy development and wildlife conservation. Thank you, Brooke, for coming back to join us for a second episode of Engage the Experts. I think the first episode on wind power and wildlife was really fresh and compelling. So I'm excited to hear you and Carl um, touch today on another high profile renewable energy source being solar power. Thank you both for, for joining us today. Yeah, thank you, Dominic and Eola. I'm happy to be back. I'm excited about this one. And thanks, Brooke, for the invite, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all today. Great. Thank you both. Um, before we jump into this conversation, I I'd just like to have each of you sort of introduce yourselves quickly and tell us a little bit about how you, you got to know each other. Sure thing. So I'm Brooke Marcus Wahlberg. Um, I'm a partner in the Nossiman LLP Austin office. Uh, my practice focuses primarily on federal natural resources law, so Endangered Species Act, Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, Clean Water Act, NEPA, Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and largely on the side of compliance strategies, permit strategies for energy development, and particularly renewable energy development. I also review and evaluate um, renewable energy development on behalf of potential investors and purchasers looking at their federal wildlife risk. And I'm Carl Kostrick. I'm a senior biologist um, at a small environmental and statistics consult consulting firm called West. My primary responsibilities are working with utility scale renewable energy developers to evaluate how their projects might affect wildlife and how their projects might be affected by the uh, presence of wildlife. So my day to day typically involves um, thinking about energy development, um, solar and wind energy primarily, and how that energy development interacts with wildlife and wildlife conservation. And so Carl and I have had an opportunity to work together many times over the last few years. I think most significantly it was on the Skookumchuck Wind Energy Facility in Western Washington, where we worked on a and incidental take permit for that facility under both the Endangered Species Act and Bald and Gold Needle Protection Act. I think our finest bonding moments have occurred over barbecue um, in Austin, Texas during conferences that were held down here. And then we've presented together a number of times, uh, typically on the Bald and Gold Needle Protection Act. 
Exactly. And Brooke, I owe you a special thanks for saving me hours in the Franklin barbecue line by recommending that uh, my friend and I walk down to La Barbecue and score some of that uh, really tasty Texas style barbecue. So it was it was well worth the walk down to that barbecue joint uh, when we were at that conference. That always makes me so happy to hear. So today we wanted to talk a little bit about our work at the intersection of solar energy development and wildlife impacts. You know, something that makes my practice fun is that the biology issues and the legal issues are really closely intertwined. And I thought Carl would be an excellent companion for this podcast because he has a great perspective and works extensively on wildlife impacts in the solar energy um, realm. I think wildlife interactions with solar don't get quite as much attention as perhaps other areas of development. So I'm looking forward to this podcast to talk about that a little bit more in depth. Okay, so let's get started. Um, you know, Carl, over the last several years, it seems you've spent an increasing amount of attention on solar energy development. I know we initially worked on the wind energy project permitting together, but it seems you've been focusing a lot on solar. Is evaluating wildlife interactions and solar energy taking up the bulk of your work these days? Brooke, it does. Um, given my role as the solar practice group lead, I'm involved in a lot of solar work within our company. And it really varies on a given day. It could be 10% to 100% of my day that I'm working on a solar related project, but it's never zero. And to explain a little bit about um, how a wildlife consultant interacts with renewable energy developers, specifically utility scale solar developers, the work that we do ranges from everything um, such as a site characterization study or a site assessment to understand what wildlife or natural resource issues might be present on the site, all the way through permitting to post-construction fatality monitoring. And, you know, one thing I'd like to um, establish up front here as, as we begin our conversation is that when I talk about solar energy today, I'm going to be really exclusively focusing on photovoltaic or PV solar energy. Uh, these are the black panels that um, you might be familiar with out on the landscape or on somebody's roof. There are other types of solar technology that being concentrating solar power, but we're not seeing the development trend towards uh, concentrating solar power. And most of our work these days, um, I would say almost all of it focuses on uh, PV solar development at the utility scale. Thanks, Carl. That's good clarification. You know, wind energy tends to make the news quite a bit for wildlife impacts, and you really don't hear as much about solar. I know in my practice, there's been more, there's been more and more solar and natural resource issues that have come across my desk in the last several years. Uh, to me, it seems that some of the easy sites, you know, the sites that don't have many uh, constraints, such as sensitive ecological features and whatnot, are becoming more and more rare as solar development increases across the landscape. What sorts of wildlife issues are you seeing arise for solar development? So, Brooke, in your podcast with Joy, there was a lot of discussion about collision risk to flying species, birds and bats. And with solar, um, particularly photovoltaic, uh, PV solar, the general theme that we're seeing is that there is uh, a focus on terrestrial species, such as desert tortoise, kit fox, grassland birds, you know, basically any species using uh, the habitat. And because what, we've, uh, what we're finding is that the collision risk to birds um, is lower than wind energy, uh, what we're seeing is a, is a trend towards thinking about wildlife issues on a landscape scale versus individual instances of mortality. As far as bats go, again, a lot of attention paid to bats at wind energy, at solar energy. Uh, we recently completed a summary of uh, bird mortality at 13, um, 10 solar sites over 13 years. And what we found is that out of all of that monitoring over all those site years, there was one bat fatality detected. So when we think about wildlife issues, because wind energy and solar energy are renewable, we don't necessarily want to carry over all of the topics and issues that we see emerging for wind energy into solar. And what we're really transitioning to is thinking about solar energy and the potential effects on terrestrial wildlife on this broader landscape scale. Yeah, and I think it's worth mentioning that the regulatory issues with solar energy development are a bit different too. Because solar has a bigger footprint on the ground, you have more land use type 
concerns, both with terrestrial species, but also triggers for other regulatory programs. You know, for Clean Water Act, if you're using, using a nationwide permit, uh, the chance of triggering one of the general conditions, either for species or cultural resources, I think increases because of the bigger footprint. And in fact, I think that more solar energy facilities will need to use individual permits under Clean Water Act than nationwide, just by virtue of the nature of the impacts and the way that the footprint works out for solar energy development. So thanks, Carl. Yeah, I'm excited to get it. Go ahead. That, well, that's, that's a good point because, um, you know, distinguishing solar from other types of technology, when you think about the size of these utility scale PV plants, they can range from a few hundred acres um, and a few dozen megawatts to several hundred megawatts, 550 megawatts developed over 4,500 acres of land. So with other types of energy development, you might be able to microsite around sensitive issues. But when you're thinking about a solar array that spans 3,000 acres, um, there are on the ground resource issues that you might be confronting that wouldn't be the same with other types of development where you might be able to microsite away from a sensitive resource. So you're, you're absolutely right that the scale of development and the on the ground acres of impact does tend to differ from what uh, the, the general wind energy footprint looks like. Yeah, absolutely. It's an excellent point. So let's talk about birds for a second. As we started mentioning birds, we'll start there and then move on. At one point, it seemed like solar did make the news a bit, specifically with respect to lake effect. I haven't heard much about that recently. Is that still a concern? It is. And the origin of the lake effect hypothesis was um, a report published by Fish and Wildlife Service in 2014. And what they found were these birds um, that are water obligates. These are birds like loons and grebes. They need water to take off and land. Otherwise, if stranded on dry land, they'll die from exposure. Um, they found some of these species at a PV energy site in the Mojave Desert. And so there was the logical progression of, well, these birds need water to take off and land or they die, that they must see these solar projects as water. So this lake effect idea caught the attention of the press and conservation groups. And in arguing against utility scale PV development, they cited the lake effect and PV projects being this sink uh, for these aquatic habitat birds. And you know, it's, it hasn't been in the news much lately, Brooke, as you've mentioned, but what I've seen recently and what our, my colleagues at West are, are seeing is that wildlife resource agencies outside of the Southwest are now starting to mention lake effect. And if there is an opposition group um, to a utility scale solar project, they might bring up, as you know, natural resource issues and wildlife. And they, um, in some cases, have referenced a, a lake effect at projects in the Midwest. Now, lake effect is it's very complicated because it is a form of a hypothesis and has, has specific rules about how to interpret it and test it. And the California Energy Commission a few years ago uh, released an RFP uh, for studies involving and understanding lake effect. And West, in collaboration with USGS Bard College in Humboldt State, is a CEC grant recipient. So there's a multifaceted research approach going on to understanding why these birds might occur. We have the data that says they do occur. And our recent publication that Dominic mentioned really expands on our knowledge. But what the grant research is trying to do is to understand why. And, and Brooke, I'll, I'll mention that understanding why a common loon, a bird that needs water to take off on land, occurs at a PV project is a lot different than evaluating the impact of a mortality of that species on the population. So I think what I'm also seeing is that there's been a, a, a blending of the question as to why are these birds occurring and what is the impact of, of these birds occurring. So it's, a, it's an active area of ongoing research. And one thing that we're trying to do is expand our inference. And by that, I mean, we have data from the Southwestern US but we have solar energy developing on the east coast of the U.S. or on the Gulf Coast of Texas. Can we take what we've learned from the Southwest and make predictions about risk to these water obligate bird species, again, loons and grebes, um, in other parts of the country? And that's where we're at 
kind of the limits of the research and there's a lot of ongoing investigations to be able to make broader inference about the potential occurrence and risk to these bird groups. Okay, that's interesting, Carl, thanks. You know, one thing that I've seen in my own practice is I've seen more eagle issues arise. Uh, the, Bald and Gold, the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act prohibits the take of eagles and that prohibition extends to disturbance of nests. Um, for those of you that don't live in the world of Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, I'm going to give you the definition of disturb here because I think it'll help you understand what exactly is being regulated in this context. But disturb as defined in the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act means to agitate or bother a bald or golden eagle to a degree that causes or is likely to cause, based on the best scientific information available, injury to an eagle, a decrease in its productivity by substantially interfering with normal breeding, feeding, or sheltering behavior, or nest abandonment by substantially interfering with normal breeding, feeding, and sheltering behavior. And it's really this prohibition on disturbance that I'm starting to see crop up in several solar energy developments. Um, to give you a sense of how this plays out, there was a case in Colorado a couple of years ago known as the Front Range case in the District Court of Colorado. And there it actually involved a residential development, but project opponents opposed the project because it occurred near a bald eagle nest. They brought a lawsuit against an eagle nest. Uh, they first challenged the service and the residential developer for not pursuing an eagle permit for disturbance of this nest. And then later, once the permit was issued, the project opponents challenged the permit itself for being improperly issued by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And so there it was the concept that construction of this residential development was going to disturb the nest in violation of that definition I just read. Well, a similar fact pattern is emerging at various solar energy developments. I've seen situations where projects are about to go to construction, maybe they have financing parties looking at the project, and lo and behold, an eagle builds a nest that year near the project. And then it becomes a question of when are you doing your construction? What are you doing? Are you going to disturb that eagle nest? Um, and I think Wes has been dealing with those sorts of issues too. Um, are you seeing similar? What are your thoughts here? Yeah, Brooke, this is where I think um, our, our worlds overlap a lot in terms of the ecology of the species, working with developers, and the regulatory implications of that species occurring. And what we're seeing is that there is an interest in identifying eagle nests within a buffer around a PV solar development in the context of disturbance, as you mentioned. In our solar uh, fatality summary, we did have a few raptor carcasses that were discovered at PV solar sites but those uh, carcasses were not necessarily attributable to any collision uh, with the solar uh, infrastructure. So we know raptors do occur as mortality, but it is, is a, a, a rare event and not necessarily attributed to collision. So the interest is going to be construction activities and ongoing maintenance activities. So what we've been seeing and what we've been hearing as recommendations from resource agencies is to conduct raptor nest surveys, ground-based, um, out to a mile and in some cases a half mile from a PV solar facility to determine if there are eagles nesting in the area. And in some cases, as you, as you noted, we, there are eagles within this um, sensitive zone that wildlife agencies have defined. And how we, how we then respond and work with developers and work with um, council to respond varies in terms of the nest location and the species with golden eagles being more sensitive to disturbance than, than bald eagles. So yeah, there's really um, a multifaceted, uh, multifaceted response. And I wanted to ask you, um, in your experience, are there ways that developers can um, minimize this risk to avoid a regulatory pathway? Or if there's a nest in close proximity, they, they might end up on that pathway. Sure. So it becomes an interesting analysis, right? I think there are some causation questions that arise where you're looking at whether or not construction of a solar project or even operation of a solar project is going to disturb an eagle nest because of everything else that's going on, right? Um, sometimes territories just move, they abandon nests, they're not using other nests for a variety of reasons. 
A lot of these projects are built in areas with heavy agricultural use where there's a lot of noisy machinery around there already. And so who knows if it's actually the solar project or not. But either way, to manage risk under the Bald and Gold Needle Protection Act, it becomes an analysis of whether the project can take measures to try to avoid and minimize risk. And that's that's where we get to work together, um, I think most closely, is looking at that definition of disturb, looking at what sorts of perhaps timing constraints outside of breeding season for when you're, you're doing your noisiest aspects of construction, uh, monitoring the nest while construction is going on to see if there's any change of behavior and if there is making adjustments then, uh, maybe even moving facilities around within the project so that perhaps lower, lower use facilities, facilities that don't require as much heavy machinery to construct or regular machinery going up and down can be moved further away from a nest. Um, and so that can be captured in, you know, kind of a risk management plan or an eagle management plan or a disturbance minimization plan, you know, it, like you can call it whatever you want, but the, it really serves the purpose of managing risk of disturbance under the Bald and Gold Needle Protection Act in a way that, that helps the developer feel confident that they are not moving into a situation where they may be disturbing an eagle in violation of the Bald and Gold Legal Protection Act and gives them some comfort that, that they are following these measures, they can avoid um, the need for a permit because they're avoiding that potential risk of violation. And oftentimes that's exactly where the biology comes in, right? Like I'm not in a position to talk about eagle sensitivities to certain machinery or their seasonal breeding habits or when nest territories go away. That's where I look to you and your expertise. Exactly, and that's that's what we've done on a few projects. Is the I guess I would call it you know bio monitoring, and you're probably familiar with this from other construction activities that have sensitive wildlife resources, where you have a biologist out there evaluating how wildlife is responding in the context of of that development. Now, now Brooke, if if one of these uh, minimization plans, management plans is developed is prepared by a solar energy developer. That, that is not a carte blanche um, opportunity for them to move into an area with nesting eagles just because they have a plan, right? They still have to be very proactive in avoiding that disturbance because of the regulation that, that you just read. You're exactly right. These voluntary plans are not permission to disturb eagles. Rather, they are documentation of what steps the developer has taken to minimize risk to eagles such that they don't think they have a reasonable basis with all these measures to conclude that disturbance isn't going to happen and therefore they don't need to get a permit for disturbance. And that's where oftentimes they include adaptive management provisions and monitoring to make sure that whatever conclusions or hypotheses and measures they've implemented that they're checking on those to make sure that that's in fact the case. Exactly, and excellent um, context there. And um, I've, I've found that uh, developers, they tend to appreciate the expertise that um, somebody like myself, a wildlife biologist, and like you, legal counsel can bring to help them navigate these issues. Because what I've seen emerge for one project is, is a very large temporal restriction throughout the breeding season of an eagle. And I think that routine maintenance activity at solar projects is very, very low impact and potential disturbance, especially as you mentioned for a bald eagle that has been habituated to human activity. And to think about creative ways and opportunities where a solar project operator might be able to get out and replace a solar panel during the bald eagle breeding season without disturbing that animal, that, that is something that I think in certain contexts can be achieved through the development of these types of plans. Agreed. So I'm going to switch directions for a moment. I know we've been talking a lot about birds and eagles, and I think some of the conversations you and I had earlier this week about some of the other types of species that are impacted by solar development are really interesting. So I'm excited to get to those, but I wanted to go back to something you mentioned. You mentioned that you're doing some studies on lake effect, and you've mentioned some other studies to me just conversationally. Um, what sorts of studies are you focused on that are specific to wildlife and solar energy development? 
If you look at the literature on renewable energy development and wildlife responses, you'll find hundreds of paper on, papers on how wildlife respond to wind. And I, I know we're focusing on solar here, but it, it does seem to be people who see solar and wind, they think renewable. And I think sometimes, Brooke, there's an expectation that because solar is a renewable energy technology, that there are more answers readily available. And what we find when we look at the literature for understanding how solar energy and wildlife interact, there's very few studies. And you know that data and information helps inform good conservation, wildlife, and regulatory policy. Otherwise, um, there's just assumptions. So the more information that ha we have, the more power we have to make good um, recommendations for development of projects and and so on. So right now, there's there we do have a paucity of information regarding some of these really important issues that are starting to emerge. Um, a, a little benchmarking here, the first bird fatality monitoring study at a utility scale um, project in California, the first big report came out in 2014 or 2015. So we're only like five years in to understanding wildlife responses to these utility scale facilities. So there's a few studies um, that are ongoing at West. Um, we're conducting studies on how grassland birds respond to the development of PV solar on a natural landscape. Uh, that was brought about by um, the project permitting process. Um, we're, we're studying how um, shrub step habitat responds to solar energy development. And again, brought about by a permitting process. And one of my colleagues is studying how um, pronghorn respond to energy, solar energy development on the landscape and how it affects their movement um, during migration. So there's, there's a lot of opportunity, Brooke, and I think what you'll start seeing is there's going to be more information hitting the literature, more reports coming about, out about um, wildlife and, and natural resource plant vegetation responses to PV solar development. Thanks, Carl. That's helpful to hear. Um, you know, I want to go back to this concept that the footprint for solar energy development is much bigger than, say, a wind turbine footprint or even a pipeline footprint by virtue of the way the PV panels take up space. And so, and to give you a range of this, we we're talking about this this week. If you think about a 3,000 acre solar project, that's the equivalent of 2,200, 2,300 football fields. I mean, these are big projects, they take up a lot of space on the landscape. And so, that creates different sorts of issues in terms of land use. And so you think about all of the on the ground type species. I mean, there's tortoises, there's listed snake species, there's toads. Um, they can all overlap with solar energy development when these projects are taking up that much space in the landscape. Now, how are these issues typically handled? Exactly, the large, um, the, the potentially large uh, land use conversion is something that permitting agencies and wildlife agencies are interested in. And it starts in a hierarchical approach with evaluating the potential for a sensitive species to occur. Let's use desert tortoise. Um, occurs in the southwestern U.S., listed federally um, as a threatened species. California Department of Fish and Wildlife just proposed um, upgrading the tortoise from threatened to endangered. Uh, state CESA level. So this is a high profile species known to be affected by developments in, in its range. Um, and what we would start by doing is understanding the development plans, looking at the range map of the species, determining if suitable habitat exists. And then if the data starts to trend in a direction where there is a likelihood for that species to occur, beyond beyond zero, like it, we're, we're moving towards likely to occur, then we would talk about conducting formalized protocol level surveys. And Brooke, you know, in, in your field, and we're thinking about the regulatory context, um, we have to think about who is the lead agency? What is the permitting um, mechanism? Is this a project on BLM land? that's going to have a section seven consultation? Or is this a project on private land that's going to have a section 10 consultation? Or is this a project on private land that has a species of interest, 
we'll say like a lesser prairie chicken, but that does not have a regulatory hook at this time. So then thinking about the agency, the jurisdiction, the regulatory context, determining the appropriate survey protocols. Um, sometimes it involves talking with a wildlife agency, BLM, for example. Other time, it involves working with experts to go out there and make sure the surveys are conducted to what I would say is a standard protocol, a, a formalized protocol, uh, like for a desert tortoise. Yeah, and there's it's a good point. There's a lot of variation between the state requirements, potentially even local requirements, and then federal requirements. And depending on which state you're in and the level of their regulations for protected species, you know, you may see a condition in a state permit for siting, not even an environmental permit, but just a siting permit that says before you construct this, you need to go do surveys for X, Y, and Z, but it's not necessarily a protected species. Or if you do have a federally protected species, then it might be a question of, are you obliged to look at effects because you've triggered um, this Endangered Species Act Section 7 consultation obligation because you're building on federal lands? Or is there the potential that they're there, you verified they're there, and now you have to evaluate whether or not you may be in violation of the Take Prohibition Endangered Species Act and then pursue a Section 10 permit. So all that can inform what level of surveys you do and how that risk is managed. Um, one thing I have to talk about is the concept of tortoise translocation. And before I even go there, I wanted to say, you know, we talk about the desert tortoise in the Southwest, but tortoise issues in solar, um, this is another example of where this is also an issue that you see in the Southeast because the gopher tortoise, I believe, is the federally listed species out in the East or protected under state. Um, so there's there's such thing as a tortoise translocation plan. And oftentimes throughout my career doing federal wildlife law, I come across these types of um, activities such as building wildlife crossings and whatnot, where I think, you know, had I known these jobs exist when I was younger, it would have been interesting to pursue a career in wildlife crossings. And when I hear tortoise translocation plans, it's one of those, I'm like, wow, I didn't realize that actually existed. But it, it really is a measure that is employed at solar energy development and other development where you have these tortoise species there. Um, Carl, can you talk a little bit about these plans and how they work? Oh, sure thing. And it, 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 to achieve um, the professional qualifications to be able to handle desert tortoise is no, no small endeavor. Uh, these folks are dedicated to spending hundreds of hours working towards their uh, certification to become an authorized biologist to handle desert tortoise. So Brooke, imagine you have a, let's say 2000 acre PV solar development. Um, you've done your presence absence survey, determined that tortoise um, are in the facility, followed the appropriate regulatory pathway, section seven, section 10, and California state uh, incidental take permit. And you're, you're going down that road, well, you're going to, the developer is going to fence the site. And if there are tortoise that are still within that fence prior to construction, you have to do something with them. You have to get them out of harm's way. And so the idea is that uh, the, the tortoises would be translocated to a, a recipient area. And this is no small endeavor because it is a listed species that is susceptible to a respiratory disease. So prior to, you can't just, you know, toss them over the fence. Um, the idea would be to find a suitable recipient area and that recipient area um, should be able to support the translocated tortoises. You have to understand the health status of the tortoises in the recipient area. So you're not bringing a healthy tortoise into um, a population of tortoises that have the respiratory disease. Then there will be a period of radio telemetry tracking to measure the tortoises movements over time, the translocated tortoises. And that could be up to five years of radio telemetry monitoring of these translocated tortoises. And depending on the number of tortoises translocated, there might be a control, a population that's monitored. So I imagine that you and listeners are quickly adding up what this might cost. I mean, this is a, an intensive effort. So if you have a solar project in a Mojave Desert region with a population of desert tortoise, it's, it's more than doing the surveys. There are going to be a lot of permit conditions or mitigation measures that come along with desert tortoise. And Brooklyn Energy Permit and, um, Rights of Way grants, there, there are a lot of measures uh, tied to 
protecting and conserving desert tortoise in the context of development. Yeah, I, I just find that fascinating. And then I also can't help but picture tortoise with little antenna walking around everywhere across the United States. So in my head, that's also a bit amusing. But it, the level of involvement of these translocation plans, I think, knowing that they exist and what goes into them, uh, it's a fascinating thing to think about. So another emerging issue that we're seeing a lot of headlines these days is pollinator species, right? You see the bumblebees, um, honeybees, monarch butterfly. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of push across the United States, both from a regulatory standpoint, but also just conservation to take measures to help preserve pollinator species. Um, at the federal level, most recently, the Fish and Wildlife Service approved a nationwide monarch conservation agreement that's aimed at offsetting impacts to monarchs that may arise from transportation and transmission right-of-ways. Um, at the end of 2020, it's expected that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service will make a finding whether or not to list the monarch butterfly for protections under the Endangered Species Act. You also have species like the rusty patch bumblebee that occurs you know, over dozens of states across the eastern United States and central United States that has been listed. And there's several more pollinator species that are up for listing or that are protected at the state level. Um, help us understand how solar development impacts pollinator species. And is there, you know, you always hear pollinator friendly. Is there a potential benefit from pollinator friendly solar? Brooke, really good context there, and this is a big question. Um, and I think we're we're getting into some really cool ideas right now about restoration, ecological value, and renewable energy development. And in our field, Brooke, we talk a lot about impacts, mortality, what are the impacts, what's the take going to be? And I like the narrative that's emerging for PV solar in terms of benefits and especially in already converted landscapes, such as agricultural landscapes. Imagine um, an area that is a water stressed environment that had some previous irrigation and um, crops, and those crops have dried up, the water resource is gone, the ground is weedy. The potential for a PV solar energy development and through restoration to not only provide clean renewable energy, but also provide wildlife value has been recognized. And there's been some ideas that have been advanced, um, for example, a solar sanctuary or a solar reef that says um, a PV solar facility that's well restored can have ecological value to wildlife, insects, and plants. Now, Brooke, pollinator friendly is a real specific twist on restoration, right? You probably Googled pollinator friendly habit solar and a picture of a solar panel with some beautiful prairie plants came up. Well, that is a, is a certain type of restoration. And in my experience um, in talking with solar energy developers, there are really a lot of nuances to restoring a solar site to meet a permit requirement and then restoring it to be what pollinator friendly solar objectives are. So imagine trying to restore a 3000 acre solar facility to a field of wildflowers. It might be practical for some smaller projects, but bigger projects might face challenges. Um, that said, you know, pollinator friendly scorecards have been developed by a number of states. Um, I, I'm not sure if anybody has evaluated the practical application or the cost of hiring um, not just your EPC contractor, but a restoration specialist to restore it to pollinator friendly. And when we say pollinator friendly, um, it's really geared towards pollinators. There are other opportunities for restoration that's going to be beneficial to wildlife outside of the context of pollinator friendly. So it's a, it's a really big question that involves um, a restoration component of a landscape. Um, and that might vary in size from a few hundred over, you know, to two, 3000 acres. So there are benef potential benefits of, of solar energy and referencing something I said earlier, um, what's the supporting information out there? Well, we're starting to see studies come up. Um, folks are interested what birds are occurring in solar projects, um, what other animals might be using solar projects. There's this idea about solar friendly fencing, a wildlife friendly solar fencing where small um, 
do- not doors, but um, openings are left in the bottle, the bottom of the um, security fence to allow small animals and reptiles to pass in and out of a solar facility. So, Brooke, it's a really big topic, and we're starting to see interest in, in restoration from wildlife agencies. And this falls under the context of, of, of habitats and what type of habitat will the solar project have after it's developed. And I think there's a general interest to provide value to wildlife and insects and to um, hopefully avoid um, ground disturbance and then weed colonization. Yeah, and I think the pollinator scorecard aspect is really interesting because there's this push to do pollinator-friendly development in general, right? And what that's turned into are these pollinator scorecards that have been adopted by states as just kind of BMPs for pollinator-friendly development. And now I'm starting to see those get wrapped into either state or local permit conditions. So even just a siting permit or a use permit may have a condition that you you know, follow the pollinator scorecard. And I think that because this area is still developing in terms of what really works in terms of restoration practices and what the actual use and impacts are, you know, my biggest concern, and I think you share this, is whether those scorecards are really reflective of what happens in development, what's realistic and what can really be maintained over the long run. And then once you have something like that, that may not be practical for your development, it may have some practical considerations that aren't a great fit. You have that as a condition in one of your state or local permits that it creates some tension there in terms of meeting your permit requirements and it actually working for the type of development that that's involved. Exactly, Brooke. Um, I'm looking at a pollinator friendly scorecard right now. And it, it starts out by saying the entomologist approved standard for what constitutes beneficial to pollinators within the managed landscape of a solar facility. And it's, I think the idea of restoration is, is trending in a direction for solar energy to be viewed as not necessarily an impact on the landscape, but a benefit. But everything you said is exactly correct. And it's, it's one of those cases where, um, in Horvath's paper in 2010 about polarized light, they showed that putting white tape on the solar panels broke up the image and resulted in fewer insects attempting to land on the solar panels. But you talk to a solar energy developer operator, they'll tell you that's a no-go because it creates an uneven um, heated surface on the solar panel. It can damage the solar panels. So I think restoration and the potential benefits to wildlife is a, is a good place to focus. But I think um, solar energy developers evaluating these pollinator-friendly scorecards and determining what are the potential costs? And like you said, what are the long-term implications of trying to maintain this habitat over the life of a project? Yeah, a lot like what you were talking about with the translocation plants, that it, you know, it's not just tossing tourists over a fence to where they can go forth and, and be safe, but there's a lot of effort and tracking and costs involved in, in actually implementing those sorts of things. And, you know, it's interesting, we've talked about several different conservation measures associated with solar energy. We've talked about the translocation plans, the eagle disturbance minimization plans, um, talked about the perhaps misguided uh, white tape on solar panels to break up polarized light. You know, we've talked a little bit about these pollinator friendly scorecards. Are there any other types of conservation measures that are frequently being employed to minimize wildlife impacts at solar energy beyond what we've talked about? Or is this essentially the gamut of what's active right now? There is there is an idea that is sort of, um, it's, it's gaining some momentum. And I think it aligns with what we've been discussing. Now, Brooke, you're familiar with a state permitting um, guidelines in assessing, for example, temporary or permanent impacts. I'm familiar with Oregon FSEC. I've, I've worked on that a bit. And there is this dichotomy, right? Permanent versus temporary impacts. And because a PV solar facility puts a fence, it is required by law to put a security fence, often six foot, sometimes eight foot, razor wire topped chain link fence around the perimeter of the energy facility. The question has begun emerging, is that a permanent impact or is that a temporary impact? And when you think about the size of some of these facilities 
and the landscape they occupy, um, that could result in a lot of mitigation, especially depending on if there's natural habitat out there. So a, a conservation measure that is being considered, and um, there's a paper by Ricky Sinha from First Solar about best management practices at a PV solar site. And the central tenet of that paper is that but through development practices that do not completely remove um, the, the vegetation and put down like a rock layer or create a hard pan, and through restoration, PV solar sites could have benefit uh, to wildlife. And so the best management practice or conservation practice that is starting to emerge is um, a practice where the PV panels are developed in and amongst the existing vegetation, that there's not this large scale um, grading of the site and that the natural topography is used and that the manipulation of the landscape is minimized and that the natural seed bank that is in the soil will regenerate um, to achieve a natural vegetation community within the solar site. So I think that's We've been hearing um, a lot about this idea regarding um, minimizing impacts during development. And I think that is a, that is a conservation measure that is, is starting to become a little bit more common when we hear about solar development. Thanks, Carl. Yeah, it's interesting. It seems that more and more in the solar energy world, a lot of the best management practices and various considerations are driven by um, some of the land use permitting and state conditions that are put in there, whether it's mitigation for state listed species or even just state habitat that's particular concern, like native prairie in North Dakota. Um, but it's not necessarily the same sorts of statutes you think about when you're thinking about Endangered Species Act impacts or that sort of thing, but it's more varied and more focused on land use because of the nature of solar energy development footprints. You know, and I guess my takeaway from our conversation, Carl, is that solar and wildlife interactions may not pull some of the big headlines, like for instance, wind energy or even pipeline development. You know, there's a number of wildlife considerations that are driven by existing regulations, by listing, state listings and whatnot. But what it really seems like is that there's a number of emerging issues that we've talked about today that are either going to drive future regulation, either through listings at the federal level or state level, but also through these state permit conditions or local permit conditions that are seeking to, um, to move solar more towards the type of, I guess, integrated landscape approach that you just described. And that, you know, as those types of issues tend to emerge, there, there usually tends to be some fumbles in terms of the um, the desire for a Garden of Eden, perhaps, and the practicalities of solar energy development and what needs what needs to be done to make the projects work and to be able to maintain them. Um, it'll be interesting to see what sorts of future regulations and permit conditions keep coming as more and more of these kind of wide ranging species and pollinator species and whatnot um, continue uh, garnering attention from both the conservation community and the regulated community. I guess before we wrap up, any last thoughts on this? I really appreciate all of your insights. That was really well summarized, Brooke. Uh, a, a great synopsis of what we've discussed today. And like you said, I think we're, gonna, we're going to learn as we go. Maybe pollinator friendly works in some prairie ecosystems on small scale projects and it's an economically feasible option and it's, and it's sustainable over the long term. But in other areas, there might be other options for the uh, land use management within a solar facility that provide benefit to wildlife generally, maybe outside of the pollinator friendly context, but still might have that moving that conversation from impacts of PV solar to the potential benefits of, of PV solar development in terms of renewable energy and wildlife. So thank you again for having me um, on the podcast today and thanks to ELI for hosting. I think it's a great forum and format to discuss these issues. Thank you for tuning in to People, Places, Planet Pod, brought to you by the Environmental Law Institute. We would like to hear from you. So please send us your questions, comments, and ideas to podcast at eli.org. And if you're interested in learning more about our work, attending one of our events, reading our publications, or becoming a member, please visit our website at www.eli.org.